How many of y'all remember watching the show back in the 90s into the 2000s, the Home Improvement Show with Tim Allen? Anybody remember? We had a lot, a lot of fans' uh, hands going up. Uh, but he had his assistant, Al Borland, who was the voice of reason that he didn't listen to. And then he was on a first name basis at the hospital. And of course, his interactions with his wife, and he always trying to be a like, manly guy. And then his wife, you know, tried to kind of bring some reason in his life. And of course, he wanted his boys to be, you know, more manly and, and, uh, and all of that. <clears throat> now, some things are sort of over-exaggerated, but there's a lot of truth there. That God has made us male and female. There is a distinction. For the next couple of weeks, we're going to be kind of looking at this through the lens of Scripture. And it's coming from the questions that were asked. I mean, these are tough questions. And uh, pray for me. Pray for me as I answer these questions. But I want to do it truthfully, but also compassionately. Because this can be a topic of hurt and pain. And this is not enough to say, well, this is what we believe and that's all it is. It's also there are people who are struggling. People who do not know what is right. And so questions like this one, where should Christians stand on the gender debate? You know, the biologically Uh, This is who I am, but this is what I identify with. That's the whole gender debate. Where do we stand? Where should we stand? Somebody else asked the question, are male and female differences imposed by the culture? Uh, And I'm sure you're aware of this where, yeah, that's what we believe. But the culture has conditioned someone to be a male or a female, so it's not really uh, the sexual organs that decide that. Uh, Here's another question. It's a tough one. I have a friend who is gay and does not care about Christianity. How do I respond? How do I reach this person? That's a tough, tough question. But here's one that we put in there because we feel like this is also happening. And how do we answer that? I have a friend who is gay but also claims to be a Christian. How do I respond? So one doesn't claim to be, another one claims to be, where do we stand? That's the whole uh, part of this, maybe another message or two in this, uh, in this uh, direction and also coming from the book of Genesis. So go and find the Genesis chapter one, verse 27. On the sixth day, God made them male and female, but here's the main point of today's message. The real battleground, the real battleground in some of these cultural attacks against Christianity is on biblical authority. Biblical authority. Do we believe that this is the Word of God? And do we believe that this has authority over my life? Do we believe that that it has the truth to speak to these issues? This is all part of the biblical authority. And it stems from seeing truth as being distinct from authority. I'll explain that in a few moments. So there is authority, but then there is truth. And they're two separate things. That's what people believe. To the contrary, we believe that God is the source of all truth, and He is the ultimate authority. So it's not like there is truth, and then there is God and His authority. He is the source of all truth. And He has authority. And hence, the Bible is the truth of God that has been tested over time. Well, that's what God says, and I do it. No, wait. There has truths that have been tested over time and found to be true, and hence, they also claim authority over our lives. Failure to obey the Bible is failure to submit to God, especially to Jesus Christ. So let's begin. Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now there's so much that is packed into this simple verse. To start with, in his own image. We'll come to this in the series, but here's the point. For you to distort the image is to challenge the original. So when you say male, female, we're not quite sure, gender categories are sort of blurred, what we're saying is there's problem in the original. We have a big issue here. So that right there, we'll come to this in the weeks ahead. In the image of God, he created him, and here's another one, if that did not clarify for you, male 
and female, he created them. Right from the first book, the first chapter, God has laid out that the genders are male and female. And we're not talking about just what you identify with, but biologically male and female. And we'll see that in a few moments. Now this verse has become the epicenter of this battleground. This is where people come and go, you know what, I cannot agree with this. Now there are three things, three options uh, in how we respond to this truth. First is, if you grew up in a Christian environment, you believe the Bible is the word of God, and when you faced problems in your life, when you had questions, when you saw, listen, hypocrisy in the church, when you went to college and you were bombarded with scientific theories, if people came along and said, if it's hypocrisy, hey, listen, don't think that that is biblical. So-and-so didn't act right. So-and-so walked out on their marriage. So-and-so did something harmful sexually, financially. Hey, listen, that's distinct. The Bible, Jesus Christ, gospel, that is still not affected. Amen. Two different things. If somebody didn't do that, what happens is it begins to impact how you see this book. If you go to college and a real winsome professor talks to you about evolution and, and science and, and how the church persecuted scientists, and, but if no one comes along like I did, or a youth pastor, or in a Christian school, or somebody at home say, no, that's not always the truth. There's a difference. The Bible did not persecute scientists. It's people who had ulterior motives who did that. The Bible has plenty of sound reasons. In fact, for the past two months, we've been going through the whole creation account. Day one, day two, day three, all the way to day six. This book makes sense. But if that does not happen, what happens is the authority is weakened in our eyes, in our mind. But here's another option. If you grew up in an environment where the Bible was not the source of authority, the source of ultimate truth, it's a big problem. We don't even get to this place. It's like, you know what? That's how you were raised. You went to church, we didn't. So you cannot force your book on me. You can't tell me how to live. That's a whole different problem. So you see the three options. You grew up in church, when you face problems, when you face questions, somebody helped you. Great. You grew up in church, you face problems, you face questions, nobody helped you, not great. You did not grow up in church and you don't believe that this is God's word. We have a big problem. Personally, I believe the second option is the worst. Here's the second option that you grew up in church, you believe the Bible, but things happened Questions came and nobody helped you. That to me is the worst. You know, help me out here. Haven't you heard from activists, college professors who grew up in church and they have a sense of agenda that I am going to dismantle the Bible? That I have this calling to free the Bible from all the cultural entanglements. So I'm here on a quest. And if you ever talk to them, what you'll find is many of them had a bad experience. They grew up in church, but something bad happened to them, and nobody took the time to say, hey, listen, I know that pastor did what he did, but that's not how it should have been. When they went to college and had all these questions come, somebody should have taken the time and said, you know, this is happening, but we have some truth as well. We can answer those questions. That category to me is the most harmful because it causes confusion, resentment, and even activism. Even I've sat, you won't believe this, I've sat in seminars listening to professors, Harvard trained, Stanford, Yale, very educated men and women, and they would always say something like this, I grew up in church, I was this, I was that, I went to youth camps, I went to Bible studies, but since then I have realized that, you know, you just have to love God 
And you have to do the best you can. And you go, wait, 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 wait. That's not what the Bible says. But you see, there's a sense of, I am here to fight against what happened. So how do we all answer all these things? Especially with regards to gender issues. To back up over here, let's look at this diagram for a moment. How do we see the Bible? It is God's revelation, God's special revelation. General revelation is nature, special revelation is the Bible. This is God's revelation, God breathed, means he inspired it. It's the breath of the Holy Spirit. As Moses wrote, as David wrote, as Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Paul, and Peter wrote, it's the Holy Spirit who was breathing through them. He used their personalities, he used their educations, he used their background, but it's the word of God, and hence it is what? Inerrant, it has no mistakes. When the scriptures are studied in the original autographs, with all the information we have, they will prove to be wholly true in everything they affirm, whether life or physical sciences or morality. That's inerrancy. It's the word of God without any errors. And hence, it has authority. Because it's God's voice, because it doesn't make any mistakes, it has authority over your life. And so, which books? The 66 books, you have 39 in the old and 27 in the new, that's it. And we went over this, remember that? In the opening of this series. And so you have to apply it because it's authoritative, you have to apply it, but not before you correctly interpret the Bible. The Holy Spirit will help you but the Holy Spirit will not keep you from errors. That's why you can have two Christians on either side, and one says this, another one says that, and both of them claim to be full of the Holy Spirit. What's happening there? You cannot just take the ball and just punt it to the Holy Spirit and say, do, do the best you can with this. You have to study the Word of God. You have to study it in the original languages. You have to study it looking at the whole context. You have to study it looking at the whole Bible, old and new, bringing them together. And that's when you have the right interpretation allowing you to apply the word of God with authority. So bottom line, this is very important. This whole gender issue comes down to authority. What do you believe? Do you believe that this is the word of God? Do you believe that it is the truth without errors, and does it have authority on your life? What is biblical authority? Definition I gave some time back, let me repeat it again. Is the authority of scripture means that all the words in scripture are God's words. All the words from Genesis to Revelation are God's words, which means this, uh, that, that in, in such a way that to disbelieve, the creation happened, the way the Bible says, oh, I don't know, I mean, I believe in kind of like, you know, billions of years or something like, to disbelieve. Did Moses really part the Red Sea? Did Joshua really part the Jordan River? Well, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's kind of up for debate, disbelief. Did Jesus really come born of a virgin? As, as, the, as the Bible pr promises and prophesizes, well, I, I don't know if the virgin birth is as essential. That's disbelief. Did he really die, buried, rose again on the third day? I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Did the Holy Spirit really come in all power? Well, I mean, okay, that's disbelief. So if you have struggled believing the truth of the Bible, you have struggled with biblical authority, but also disobey. You can believe all day long and not do what the Bible tells you to do. That also challenges biblical authority. Let me put another mark underneath it. Because I can say it, oh yeah, that's the word of God. Why don't you do it? Well, you know, because you know, what's really happening is internally you've said that's the truth, but there could be truth somewhere else as well. Which kind of leads us to this diagram. Now pay attention. This, this message is gonna get a little complicated, but if you stay with me, it'll make a lot of sense. Because sitting here this morning are people 
who see the Bible this way. So this is the Bible. And it has some truth, but it doesn't necessarily have all the truth. Where is truth? Truth is independent of authority. And the reason we've been in a mess, you know, because sometimes a church believe things and they try to hold the scientists down and Galileo was thrown in prison. So you see, the truth is out here. Sometimes this interferes with this. So we got to keep those two separate. There are people here this morning who will say, well, I believe there's a little bit of truth that kind of overlaps with the Bible. Some things, kind of like a Venn diagram here. Some things, you know, about fallenness, need to be saved, want to go to heaven. There's some truth there. But how about like medical things? How about how the world was made? How about geology and astronomy? Oh, that kind of falls here. Bible is here and it's really good for certain things. Maybe a little bit more too. Read the book of Proverbs. Kind of helps you make wise decisions and how to raise your family. Stuff like that. But really, truth is here. Where do you stand? Is that how you see the world? Is that how you see the word of God? So let's begin. First, let's look at biblical authority. What does it mean when we say the Bible has authority over your lives? Number one, it means that it is God's word. It is breathed by God. In uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, All scripture, old and new, is given by inspiration. Remember that old diagram I showed you in the opening? It is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That's what the Bible says. So when I'm reading this book, in a way I'm reading Moses, but behind Moses is the Holy Spirit. God is speaking. In, in a way, when I read Joshua, it's Joshua who wrote it, but it's really God. Using Joshua's personality as a fighter, as a general, as a leader. When I read Psalm 23, wow, I'm reading this shepherd boy's idea of how God leads us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me beside still waters. He restores me. all that is wonderful. But ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit who helped David write through his personality. So when we talk about authority, keep in mind, it means these are the words of God. People say, well, you know, the Old Testament, I can see that. How about the New Testament? I, 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 I don't know for sure. Is it on the same level? Because I feel like these are more opinions here. Old Testament is God telling us how to live. New Testament sort of, you know, Peter contradicts Paul and Paul contradicts Peter and the Gospels contradict. Are we sure it's on the same level? Listen to 2 Peter chapter 121. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. This is not in the Old Testament. This is the New Testament. Now, I want to show you another reference in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. This is where Peter is talking about Paul. Now, pay attention to how he addresses Paul's letters. 2 Peter 3, 16. As also in all his epistles. Whose epistles? Paul's epistles. Peter is talking about Paul. Speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction. So to help you understand what Paul, Peter is really saying is this. When people read Paul's letters, there are some things that are hard to understand and people are using them to you know, make their arguments and claims and it's really not what Paul meant. But pay attention to the last line. As they do also 
the rest of the scriptures. How many of y'all caught that? What he said there is so important because he just called Paul's letters scriptures. Which means it was not the church that came together at the Council of Nicaea that said, you know, we're going to call those 27 books the books of the Bible on the same level. No. Right in the first century, Peter was calling Paul's letters the Word of God. Now, what did Paul say? 1 Corinthians 14, 37. If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you, read it with me, are the commandments of the Lord. Now, folks, I write a lot. I write academically. I write in the newspaper. uh, I write um, sermons. But this, what I write is not the Word of God. It is about the Word of God. I would not dare for a millisecond claim that what I'm preaching to you is the Word of God. It's my understanding of the Word of God. It's the truth, but it's truth that has come through my personality. Has the Holy Spirit protected me? I believe so. The more I pray, the more I study, the more I have affirmations from you, I know that what I'm preaching is the truth. But it's not, listen, it's not on the same level as what Paul has written and Peter has written and Moses and Daniel and and Malachi and the rest of them have written. It's not on the same level. You know what Paul is claiming over here? That what he has written is the word of God. So, going back over here for a moment, When we talk about the Bible authority, Old Testament plus New Testament is the Word of God. Genesis to Revelation is the Word of God. Now, something else about authority. This is kind of subjective, but I think it's true. I read a lot every week. I know some of you all do as well. You know, you read for personal growth, business, work, teaching, whatever. It's very different when I read this book. Now, I read this book nonstop. I read it for writing articles. I read it for writing essays. I read it for helping people, teaching Greek. But then every morning, I have my time of reading the Word of God without any other reason than to feed myself. I purposely do not pick passages that I will preach on. Here's what I find. When I read this book, is God speaking to me. I read a passage from the Old Testament, I read a passage from the New Testament, and I can, I can hear, how many of y'all know what I'm talking about? I can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit talking to me. And look, here's the funny thing. I might be in some of the dullest books in the Old Testament. Not dull because they're not inspired. Dull because it's about rules and regulations and laws and how to build a tabernacle. And you're going, but even there, the Holy Spirit will preach, speak to me and say, you know, this is how important it was that they were holy. Are you holy? It's like, oh, I feel it. Thank you, Lord, for reminding me. The way I talk to my wife, that wasn't holy. Uh, the way I, I, I responded to that sin, that wasn't holy. The way I was watching that movie, I should have turned it off, that wasn't holy. You see what God is doing? As I'm reading this book, I'm reading Deuteronomy. I'm reading Numbers. And God is convicting me of sin in my life. Then I will go to the New Testament book, read the book of Revelation, and it's all these trumpets and bowls and all these things happening. After a while, you go, good grief. I, I don't know. I don't think for a moment I haven't studied prophecy. I've studied, I preached for like three years on prophecy. But you see, for a moment you feel like, you know, it's, what is all this about? And the Holy Spirit will speak to me. Jesus is coming back. No matter how dark it gets, No matter how terrible it may be, God is still in control. He speaks to me. Hey, listen, I read a lot. No other book speaks to me like this. Are you all with me on that? So the Bible has authority because it's God's word. 
but it also has authority because it speaks to me as I read the word of God. Let me give you a verse, because if you're here this morning and you go, you know, I read the Bible, but I don't, I don't feel like it, anything is speaking to me. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. Again, Paul says this, these things we also speak, not in words, which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual, but the natural man. You know who the natural man is? A person who does not have the Holy Spirit. You know who the natural man is? The person, the man or the woman who does not know Jesus Christ as their savior. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. So, oh, I believe it's God's word. I just don't feel God speaking to me. Folks, one of two things. Either you're lost, or you got some sin in your heart, some disobedience in your life, that you need to come and say, God, I'm sorry, I need to change and I need your help. Let's go over that again. If you say, yeah, I always grew up believing the Bible is God's word, no problem there, but I don't feel like God is speaking to me as I read the word of God, as I read the Bible. One or two things, either you're lost, or you have either sin in your heart or some disobedience. Some place God has told you again and again, obey, and you're saying, no, not right now. So, Authority, God's word, and it speaks to me, and I know it is through the Holy Spirit. But then what do you do with this thing right here, truth? Is truth separate from the Bible? Are there two distinct things? No. To start with, God is truth. They're not two different things. God is the source, God is the author, God is the content of truth. Listen to Titus chapter one and verse one. Paul, a bond servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, Who cannot lie? So when we say something like, you know, there are things out there in the realm of uh, uh, medicine. There are things out there in the realm of geology. There are things out there in the realm of physics or chemistry. Uh, there are things out there in the realm of this whole gender issues. I mean, this is truth. And then you have the Bible. Two separate things. We have a problem. We have a problem because we believe God is not the truth. So when he speaks on these matters of medicine or geology or physics or chemistry, gender, we cannot trust him. He is outdated. He doesn't have enough knowledge. Verse two again, Titus one, two in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie. So when he speaks on those subjects, he's telling us the truth. But something more, truth is more than just information. I told you this message is a little deep, but stay with me. Truth is more than just principles. Truth is a person. Who is that person? Jesus Christ. Look at this reference right here, John chapter one, verse 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. All truth is in Jesus Christ. And when people came to him and said, you know, how do you show us the way? What did Jesus say to them? John 14, six, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth and the life, which means this, this whole idea of truth being separate from authority is false. 
Let me show you a better diagram. When it comes to the Bible, okay, I didn't say the church. I didn't say my denomination. I did not say Pastor Shaw. I'm talking about the Bible. Authority and truth are one and the same. It has authority because it's God's word, Old and New Testament. It has authority because I can feel that it's God speaking to me when I read the Bible. But also, it is the truth. Why is it the truth? Because God cannot lie. So if you look at anything in the Bible and say, I know what the Bible says here, but you know what? This is what I learned here. This may not be the truth. You have a different problem. And by the way, the Bible itself claims to be telling us the truth. Listen to Joshua chapter one, verse eight. The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. You need truth. The Bible is the word of God, but also the Bible is the truth. Truth about life, truth about sciences, and truth about morality. Yeah, this is the one we have big trouble with. Sciences, now you know, Newton, Newton did not come until, you know, 17th to the 18th century. I mean, prior to Newton, I mean, we didn't know about the laws of motion. We didn't know about, you know, the first law and the second law and the third law. We didn't know about gravity being 9.8 meter per second square. We didn't know about velocity and impulse and momentum. Show me a passage in the Bible that talks about velocity. Can you, can you show me that? Oh, I hear you. The Bible may not go in details, but Bible does tell me this, in the beginning God made the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of the Lord was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. You see, what I'm trying to help you understand is, it may not go into all the little details, but the overarching truths are in the book, are in the Bible, whether it has to do with life, sciences, and morality. The Bible has been proven to be true again and again and again. So how does this apply to the gender debate? This is where it gets a little sensitive. Men and women were designed by God. Male and female, he made them. He made the woman, he designed her to compliment. Now you say, well, I, I disagree with that. If you disagree with that, you gotta go back here and ask the question, do you have authority and truth in the same circle or is it separate? But if we're okay here, we can move on and actually read the passage, which is Genesis 2, 18. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper comparable to him. Does that mean that she is inferior to the man? No. Does that mean it's right when people have, you know, paid a woman less than they paid a man for the same job? No. Is it right that even in a Western culture, women are mistreated? No, none of that is right. All that is wrong, but that does not have anything to do with this book. That's human behavior. Even in our advanced Western society, even with people thumping the Bible. But if they're going against this book, it's not the book's fault, it's their fault. What does the Bible say? God made the woman, who was made first, by the way? The man, and y'all are afraid to say it. <laughs> Think about my position, I'm not even from around here, and I'm saying it. God made the woman to be a helper comparable. It's very important, comparable. But she's there to assist him. 
Does that make him superior? Not for a single moment. What does the Bible say? We're talking about authority, right? We're talking about truth. One flesh. I don't know if we have kids in here, but we're gonna try to be as discerning as possible. What does it say in Genesis 2, 24? Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become, you all afraid to say it? One flesh. One flesh. One flesh. A man and a man can do that, a woman and a woman cannot do that. It's one flesh. And yes, we're speaking sexually. Oh, in church we talk about that. It's because the church doesn't say anything that we are sitting back here running away. And the culture keeps coming. And the neighboring counties keep passing laws. And, and things are going crazy. And, and we don't say anything because, I, 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 I don't know, you know, you know. God said it. That's the authority, is the word of God. And it's also the truth. It's the truth. I don't get any amen, that's all right. All right, maybe, can, can I have an amen on this one, for goodness sake? This is procreation. Can we at least agree on that one? Amen. All right, thank you. Procreation, man and man cannot have children. Woman and woman cannot have children. It's a man and a woman coming together. And I do understand there are people who are called to a single life. Praise God for that. There are people who cannot have children. Couples cannot have children. And that's understanding. We, we know how painful that can be, so I'm not talking about that. But when a man and a woman come together, something happens sexually, right? And children are born. It doesn't happen any other way. And sometimes you have shocking and jarring headlines that say man gives, that's not true. It was not a man before. Here's a passage. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Verse 28, then God blessed them, the man and the woman, and God said to them what? Be, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, fill the earth. Now it doesn't mean that anybody can tell you how many kids you can have. That's between you and your spouse and God. You may have one, two, five, 10, 20. Uh, let the Holy Spirit tell you how to fill the earth, okay? I'm not gonna do that. But the point is very simple. is when that male and female come together, that's when it happens. Here's something else. The whole Old Testament, New Testament, the Old Testament, Word of God, New Testament, we're not sure, but we looked at Paul and Peter's writings and also Jesus, Jesus affirmed it. So let's stop talking about pork and should we or should we not eat it and how that means, let's stop that, stop that. There are laws that were given for a time and place, then there are laws that are consistent. How do we know that? Jesus affirmed it in the New Testament, right? Grace, the period of grace. And he answered, Matthew 19, 4, and said to them, have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become what? Jesus said it. Can't do that with a man and a man, a woman and a woman. Here's the last one. Oh, wait, wait, let's finish this. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. The last one. It's a divine symbol. Very important. When we begin to challenge what God has said, he made them male and female. Please know for a moment not only are we challenging the original, which is God, not only are we challenging the authority of what God has said and how things are to be, but we're also tampering, tampering with a very important symbol, Christ and the church, the mystery from before time. Listen to what Paul says in Ephesians 5, Ephesians 5, 31, for this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. 
This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning in this, Christ represents the male, the church represents the female. This is not a sexual union, it's a spiritual union. We are one with him. When you take away the whole male and female, not only are you challenging what God's word has said, not only are you disregarding the truth, but you're tampering with what's happening here. So this is male and male, then it's Christ and Christ. If it's only female, female, then it's church and church. You see how people sitting in church can be ignorant and say things like, well, you know, I don't know what the Bible says, but you know, I feel like in today's world, if you don't know, just be quiet. <laughs> if it's best, right? Just be quiet and say, you know what, I don't know, I need to learn more. I don't know enough Bible. But when you say, oh yeah, that's fine, and as long as they're loving, and as long as they care, and as long as they have, you know, uh, best friends or whatever, wait. You're tampering with a mystery, which is a great mystery that concerns your salvation, that concerns every fellowship that claims Jesus Christ. See, that's why when people say something like, all sin is sin. I believe that any sin can send you to hell. But not all sins are on the same level. Somebody stealing something or somebody committing adultery, it's wrong. You shouldn't do that. They need repentance. But when you begin to mess with gender, you're going on a whole different level. And people, people are like, oh, that's, I don't, know, I don't know. Take it up with the Bible. Take it up with the Word of God. In a couple of Sundays following, we're gonna talk about how this works out, why this is the way it is. But for here, for now, the Bible claims authority over your life because it is the Word of God, but also because it is the truth. There are a lot of books out there. How do I know that this book is the one I'm gonna live by? It is the Word of God, but it's also the truth. I mean, every one of those points I showed you, isn't that true? They're true. And when you contradict them, societies, cultures, civilizations begin to fall apart. It's the truth. So I, I do this not just because it's the Word of God, but it's also because it is the truth. The Bible has been tested and retested and found to stand true, and it demands our submission. Authority and truth are one thing. But let me now switch gears as I close. This may be a tough message for you. Maybe you grew up in a tradition where this was not an issue. Maybe you have children or friends who are in this lifestyle. Maybe you struggle with this. And we're not here to dissect and do psychotherapy on you. And what happened, we're not gonna talk about that right now. So when I speak to you, it's not to make fun. It's not to talk down. I have friends who are in this lifestyle and my heart breaks for them because they're living in sin. And it's very sad. I have people I know who are broken hearted because their children have chosen that life. And you go, what, what happened here? How did that happen? What happened? So this is a tough message. But just know, God answers prayers. And he is able to break the chokehold of culture and the enemy and evil and set people free. He does that all the time. And so this morning, you have someone on your heart, someone, loved one, struggling with this? Pray for them. Pray with brokenness, pray with tears. Never talk down, don't be hateful. Don't be judgmental. Be kind, but listen, don't compromise. Don't compromise the truth. Stand on the truth and still love them. And if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, as your King, today's the day to give your heart to Him. Be saved.